friends and those tuning in this morning via Facebook Live. A couple of announcements we get started this morning. I remind you guys that uh, the Annie Armstrong Easter offering will begin next Sunday if you choose to give to that offering. Even though we don't have service here, you can, you can mail your offering to the church treasurer. So please call uh, Ms. Slayton and get the offering mailed to her uh, through the month of April. We'll take that all the way through the last Sunday of April, so make note of that if you can. Also, if we don't have services here on Easter, we'll postpone the Easter egg hunt until later, maybe the next month or so. We'll look at that on down the road if we can do that. Uh, a couple things else uh, going forward, we'll be broadcasting Sunday school services every Sunday morning before the, the worship service as normal. Brother Harris will be leading those every Sunday morning. As always, I'll uh, be doing the Wednesday night services, 6 p.m., also via Facebook Live. Uh, I encourage you guys to tune in for that at 6 o'clock every, every Wednesday evening. It's the Gospel of Matthew starting in a couple of weeks. We're going to finish up Galatians uh, this coming Wednesday and then start Matthew after that and going as far as we need to until church services resume here at the church. And then we'll come back and uh, see where this takes us. If you'd like transcripts of the sermons, uh, please uh, email me, text me, message me via Facebook. Every sermon, every Bible study transcripts are absolutely free. Just let me know in advance. I'll be glad to email those out to you guys as you request those. Also, keep sending your prayer requests in between now and next Sunday. If it's something that's not personal or private, we'll be glad to read those over the air. And, of course, we'll be praying uh, in those services as well. Just email those uh, through the course of the week. And if it's not a personal or private matter, of course, we can have those read over over the air Facebook Live. So appreciate you guys uh, tuning in today.
start to John chapter number one. I'll be there in a moment or two. The title of the sermon is The God Who Came, The God Who Came. And while you're turning to John chapter one, the prologue of the Gospel of John, I'll share with you a couple of stories. I was at the dentist not long ago, and while the dentist was looking at my teeth, he was making some small talk, and he said, so what do you do? I said, well, I'm a pastor. And he was still looking at my mouth, was kind of quiet. I didn't say anything. So it's, I said, you know what I like to preach? I like to start off with a joke sometimes. I find that kind of a fun thing to do. And he said, uh, he paused. He said, it's interesting. He said, let's do it. Let's get an impression. And I said, well, it's more observational humor. Uh, actually, I don't really do impressions. The dentist said, of your teeth, I mean. So there that was. Me and John wanted just a second or so here, and I appreciate you guys laughing out loud for that because it was, it was hilarious. <laughs> One more story. Uh, Gary is having a yard sale. You guys go to yard sales. Gary was having a yard sale, and a minister bought a lawnmower from Gary, but he returned it a couple of days later, complaining that the lawnmower just wouldn't run. It'll run, Gary said, but you got to cuss at it to get it started. The minister was shocked. He said, well, I have not even uttered a curse word in 30 years. Gary said, just keep pulling the cord, it'll all come back to you. <laughs> <laughs> well, I want to ask the question to start off this evening is this. What would happen if God showed up in a real and tangible way? What would happen if God showed up in a real, tangible way? How would the world handle it? How would the material universe respond if God were to enter our time and space and just show up all of a sudden? Well, the good news is that God did show up into our time and space, that God did arrive at one point in our time. He did enter our reality. In fact, he became flesh. The thrust of the Christian message, the thrust of the gospel is that God himself became flesh. He died on the Roman cross, was buried, and of course, rose from the dead. The essence of Christianity is not that, God can, that men can become gods, it's that God became man. How would the world again, look if Jesus had not come? If Christ had never came to earth, how would the world look today? Well, there'd be no church buildings, that's for certain. Probably no orphanages. Certainly there'd be fewer hospitals in the world, fewer wells dug in third world countries. If Christ had not come, the world would look different today. If you think the world looks bad now, imagine a world without Christians in it. This might seem like a dream for some people, but it'd really be a nightmare. Imagine a world not preserved by the salt of Christians. John began his gospel very clearly, very clear prologue, stating in fact that God did come into our time and space. John chapter one, verses one. In the beginning five. was the word and the word was with God and the word was God. He was in the beginning with God and all things were made through him and without him was not anything made that was made. In him was life. The life was the light of men. The light shines in the darkness. The darkness has not overcome it. Let us pray. Our Father, we bow before you at this time, asking that you be with us as we open your word. Ask that you would have us to say only what it means and go no further. Father, that we would rightly handle your text. In Christ's name we pray. Amen. But John begins his prologue saying that the word was with God. The preposition with is very important here. It says that this eternal word of God was alongside, beside of God himself. But more than that, John says he wasn't just with or alongside of God. That's the preposition used. He says this word was God. There are some that understand the Logos, this word, to be just the wisdom of God, the mind of God. Well, it's, it's true that God does have the attribute of wisdom. In fact, God has omnipotent, uh, all-powerful wisdom, if that's such a thing. He's omniscient. He knows everything. And he's also uh, all-wise, all isn't he? But the attribute of wisdom is, of course, uh, not God's only attribute. Wisdom itself is not a tangible thing. Though God might possess it, it's not along beside of God. It is an attribute of God as other attributes that God possesses. Well, John tells us the word was with God, and moreover, the word was God. So if the word simply means the logos or the wisdom of God, notice we take that uh, preposition with, uh, and, and logos is being with, uh, the wisdom of God being with God. Uh, it does not say, it does not follow logically that the, that the logos, uh, the wisdom, is God. 
It's interesting, isn't it, that uh, though God might possess wisdom, wisdom, of course, is not God. But in this prologue of the Gospel of John, uh, it parallels the creation story. Here, think about this. John informs his readers that in the beginning, just like in the beginning of creation, there was darkness. And the eternal word of God, the Son of God, entered the material universe. And out of the vast darkness of nothing, the word spoke in the creation story. And there, everything came to be. In a moment, from nothing to everything. This is John's nativity. This is, this is John's Christmas story. That in the darkness... God spoke. The word enters time and space. He comes into a dark world. He comes into this world as the very light of the world. The same God who spoke creation also spoke and created his own DNA, forming his own lungs, that he would cry as an infant. The Bible says, then there was light. And John says, light entered into a dark world. Now, John uses the word light metaphorically. The light of men as the glory of God shining in the darkness of the world. Darkness, what is darkness? But it's the absence of light. At the close of the Old Testament, there's a 400-year period of silence. From the last book of the Old Covenant to the New Testament opens. 400 years of silence, there was darkness there. The world was in spiritual darkness, unable to gaze at the very glory of God, lost in darkness. Look in verse number 9. John says, The true light, which gives light to everyone, was coming into the world. He was in the world, and the world was made through him. Yet the world did not know him. He came to his own, and his own people did not receive him. But to all who did receive him, who believed in his name, he gave the right to become the children of God, who were born not of blood, nor of the will of the flesh, nor of the will of man, but of God. The saddest part of the Incarnation is the thick veil that hung over the hearts and the minds of the Jewish people. The saddest part of the incarnation is this thick veil that hung over the hearts and minds of the Jewish people. You see, there's a darkness far worse than the absence of photons of light. It's a moral darkness that blinds men to God. But God came. See, in verse 14, we see and the word, verse 14, this is the Christmas story, and the word became flesh and dwelt among us. And we have seen his glory, the glory of, as of the only Son from the Father, full of grace and truth. The God who entered the world came as an infant, grew into adulthood. And the word, word for dwelt in this passage in verse 14 is the Greek word skinu, which basically means to tabernacle or tent, to pitch a tent, uh, to live in a tent. And John's calling our mind back to the old tabernacle of the old covenant, the old tabernacle of the wilderness, the makeshift temporary uh, housing of God, the forerunner for the very temple itself, the, which would house the Shekinah, the Shekinah glory of God. Jesus tented, John would say. Jesus tabernacled, John did say, among us. In a frail, mortal form, he walked among us. question now is why? Why the incarnation? Well, the incarnation was necessary because first, you cannot kill God. And second, man cannot be perfect. So God had to become flesh. The same God who became flesh was then crucified, was dead, was placed in a tomb. For three days, there was no life. He lay lifeless, cold, and limp. Make no mistake about this. Nothing short of a miracle would bring him back to life. The same kind of blindness exists in the world today. There are those who do not believe. In spite of the evidence of both uh, the resurrection evidence and the evidence of the material universe, some men remain blind today. In his 1968 book entitled Reason and Responsibility, Anthony Flew published the following parable, which has become the famous parable uh, for its supposed critique of Christianity. It's a parable of the, of the unbeliever. It starts like this. Once upon a time, two explorers came into a clearing in the woods. And in the clearing were growing many flowers and many weeds. One explorer says, some gardener must, have, must tend this plot. And so they pitched their tents and set a watch. And no gardener is ever seen. 
but perhaps he's an invisible gardener. So they set up barbed wire fence along the perimeter. They electrify the fence. They patrol with bloodhounds. Because they remember H.G. Wells and famous uh, Invisible Man, how he could uh, not be seen though he was present. But no shrieks ever came from someone uh, who was just invisible. Wire was never touched. The cry of bloodhounds never sounded. This invisible gardener was neither seen, heard, nor smelt. Yet the believer is not convinced. He said, but there is a gardener, an invisible, intangible, insensible to electric shocks, a gardener who has no scent and makes no sound, a gardener who comes secretly to look after the garden which he loves. At last, the skeptic despairs. But what remains of your original assertion? Just how does what you call an invisible, intangible, eternally elusive gardener differ from an imaginary gardener or even from no gardener at all? It's a parable of unbelief, isn't it? It's a parable not just of unbelief, but a parable for unbelievers. A parable used to describe the elusive uh, God who never makes himself known, who they try to describe the universe as being an uncaused material form. But this parable overlooks one very important point. It's this, there's still a garden. The fact that the material universe exists is proof that it once had a beginning. Go outside if you can, and look at the oak tree in your yard or around your neighborhood. You know, of course, it wasn't the first oak tree you ever seen because you've seen older oak trees. But this oak tree is evidence of the fact that it was once an acorn. Behind every oak tree is an acorn. And behind that acorn is another acorn all the way back. In fact, the oak tree in your neighborhood is proof there's older oak trees somewhere else. Proof that oak trees come from oak trees all the way back to the first acorn or the first oak tree. But the principle that's true, whether we're talking about oak trees or the great blue whale or dwarf stars, everything that exists, uh, that, that began to exist, supposes that it once had a beginning. But the skeptic insists, just how does what you call an invisible, intangible, elusive, eternally elusive gardener differ from an imaginary gardener or even from no gardener at all? How does the God that you, that you say you worship differ from no God at all? Here's how. Because there's still a garden. See, the garden presupposes the one who planted it. Gardens don't plant themselves. Only a person who's never had a garden, never managed a garden, can assume that gardens create themselves. But just how does what you call an invisible, intangible, eternal elusive gardener differ from an imaginary gardener or even from no gardener at all? Where's the gardener? I want to read this parable reminded of the text I'll close with in John chapter 20. It was the day of Christ's resurrection in early morning hours as the first witnesses go to the tomb. You see in John 20, verses 1 through 2. Now on the first day of the week, Mary Magdalene came to the tomb early while it was still dark and saw that the stone had been taken away from the tomb. So she ran and went to Simon Peter and the other disciple, the one whom Jesus loved, and said to them, They have taken the Lord out of the tomb, and we do not know where they have laid him. And then you get to verse 11. But Mary stood weeping outside the tomb, and as she wept, she stooped to look into the tomb, and she saw two angels in white, sitting where the body of Jesus had lain, one at the head and one at the feet. And they said to her, Woman, why are you weeping? And she said to them, They have taken away my Lord, and I don't know where they have laid him. And having said this, she turned around and saw Jesus standing there, but she did not know that it was Jesus. Jesus said to her, Woman, why are you weeping? Whom are you seeking? Supposing him to be a gardener. She said to him, Sir, if you've carried him away, tell me where you've laid him, and I will take him away. Jesus said to her, Mary. She turned and said to him in Aramaic, Rabboni, which means teacher. Let me say this, the gardener came. The gardener came, he was nailed to cross beams, he was laid in a tomb, 
On Easter Sunday morning, the gardener rose from the dead. In the midst of their hopelessness, the gardener came. Do you know this gardener? Do you know this God? Have you made peace with him? One day you'll stand before him. And there'll be no doubt then you will know the gardener. Let's pray. Our Father, as we conclude this service, we ask simply that you would search our hearts and minds. Remind us, Father, that you invite us even now to come before you. For those that don't know you, you invite them to come this day as you draw them to yourself, that they'd find salvation full and free. Be the brother and sister in Christ who has despair and doubt, who struggles with unbelief. Father, be with them in a very special way. For it's in Christ's name we pray. Amen.
Thank you for tuning in today. We appreciate you guys coming via Facebook Live today. I would ask you to tune back in tonight at 6 p.m. and catch the evening service. If not, we'll have these videos posted as you can view during the course of the week. I'll also return Wednesday night at 6 p.m. We're going to have a Bible study in the last part of Galatians, Galatians chapter 6 coming up Wednesday night. Tune in for that. And uh, look to see you guys later this week. Please email me, text me your prayer concerns, and we appreciate you guys tuning in. Thank you and God bless. Thank you.